I adopted a neutral French accent, void of any regional or class inflection. It was the French my professors and classmates um, were speaking with, and the one that I started using in class, uh, in national exams, and in daily life. From that point on, I've had two accents in French. The one that I use with my family and friends back home, and the one that I use with everyone else. The day that I acquired my second French accent is the day I entered the class closet. I'm telling you this, not only to say that I recognize myself a lot in what uh, Didier Fibon says in, in Returning to Mans, but, today, but to say that this uh, book deals with an issue that most of us here can relate to. The issue of how, how class affects who we are and who we can become. Didier Ribon's Returning to Hans of Thought Biography tells the story of a young man, of a young gay man, for whom education, and higher education in particular, was the key to his escape from his parents' working class life. Yet, his is not the usual rise to rich, riches story. Ribon, now an acclaimed French public intellectual, starts his sociological introspection, his term, by asking, why was it easier for him to come out as a gay man than it was to admit to his working class roots? Where did the shame he felt over his working class parents come from? Why did he, did he deem it necessary to turn his back on his community in order to embrace his gay identity? And why, having theorized what it means to be gay, did he not think of theorizing what it means to be working class? Returning to Hans and Eribon's coming out of the class closet. But it is much more than that. It is also taking his family's social history as a case study, his attempt to comprehend the mechanisms by which society assigns class positions, and the way to, in which people come to internalize social hierarchies and social norms. Class positions define for those who occupy them what is possible for them to be and to become. In Ehrenbaum's view, rather than being an engine of upward mobility, education func functions primarily as an institution that reproduces social hierarchies. Herobon's brothers all dropped out, uh, uh, all dropped out of high school uh, to take manual jobs, as did all of their working class friends. Herobon's social trajectory from Hans projects to Paris left bang was then, as he argues, a fluke. He calls it a miracle. He avoided his brothers and visual and social fate in large part because of his homosexuality which led them to disidentify, disidentify from his homophobic family at a young age and to take refuge in trolls. But, as everyone realizes in the wake of his father's passing, self-reinvention has its limits. The manner in which one is socialized, the hidden injuries of class, to use Richard Sennett's term, do leave indelible marks. Ehrenbaum exceeded the limitation of the social class, but he carried these limitations within him in the form of social shame. So, what is it about class that makes it so difficult to talk about? Why was it easier for Didier Ribon to come out as a gay man than it was to come out as working class? Why did I feel, instinctively, the need to hide my class origin by changing the way I sounded? What are you doing right now to hide your social background, whether you're upper middle class, middle class, or lower class? Why does class have such a sway on us? What is it about class that makes some of us want to hide and find safety in the class closet? And what's there? Why is it so hard to come out? What are we so ashamed of? So today, with the help of Didier Ribon, we will try to understand the root of the social shame associated with belonging to a lower class. To do so, 
we need to do three things. First, we need to define what class is and examine different approaches for the understanding of social class. Second, and to remind ourselves that class is not just a French thing, or even a British one, <laughs> we will look at class stratification in the US today. Third, we will move to Didier Rivon's essay and examine four key concepts that will help us answer the question posed in the title of the lecture, The Class Closet. How do we get in and what can't we come out? Here is the outline of my one hour call on lecture. Today I will give you a 30 minute abbreviated version. Needless to say, some details will be left out, but I will give you uh, the main points. Defining class. Talking about class means talking in some way about social and economic inequalities. The notion of social class implies the existence of a social hierarchy or stratification on the top of which we have a number of individuals or families who enjoy a disproportionate share of wealth, power, prestige, um, and access to other valued resources. All known societies are marked by social inequalities. They differ only in the degree to which they are unequal. Despite the universality of social inequalities, however, the notion of social class is a contested one. Among social scientists, there is disagreement about how best to define the concept of social class, and some deny its usefulness in empirical research. But broadly speaking, we can distinguish two main methodological approaches to the concept of social class, an economic approach and a sociological approach. So, economists tend to look at income and wealth, and sociologists tend to look at economic positions, that is, occupations, as well as life-defining experiences across several spheres, such as identity, education, politics, health, family life, or urban communities. Though I will not uh, discuss uh, their works in detail today, uh, Karl Marx, Max Weber, and French sociologist um, Pierre Bourdieu are notable theorists. Uh, whose ideas have shaped our understanding of class. Regardless of the approach taken, social scientists and uh, by and large agree that birth in a specific social class shapes your life chances in profound ways. Class, for example, can affect your birth weight, your cause of death, when you will marry, who you will marry, how much education you are likely to attain, where you will live, what you will eat, how often you will go out to eat, what you will say, and of course, how you will say it. Of course, factors other than class also shape the forces of one's life. Your gender, but also, and perhaps more crucially in this country, your race. Race compounds the effects of class and gender in complex and traumatic ways. To the point that some scholars have argued that the two are so interrelated it is a mistake to study class without taking race into account. I would venture to say that race is actually central to the way class is structured in the United States. Now, with these definitions and considerations in mind, let us now take a quick look at the US class stratification system. And again, in the interest of time, I will give you a, a snapshot. Class stratification in the U.S. Um, today, most social scientists doing empirical research divide society in three broad categories. A class of people who own the means of production, a middle class of professionals, small business owners, managers, and a lower class uh, in which people have lower paying jobs or live in poverty. The image uh, usually <laughs> conjured to represent this stratified and hierarchical social system is that of the rungs on the ladder. But if the social scientists uh, conceptualize social inequalities in terms of class, Americans in general do not typically use phrases like lower class or upper class or even the ruling class. Unlike other countries in which these terms are in common use, class-laden terms are rarely uttered in American public discourse or in the media. The only, the only 
uh, class term that is widely used in public discourse and in the media is the term middle class. Interestingly, when asked um, which class they belong to, 80% of Americans identify with some gradation of middle class. Lower, mi lower middle, middle, or upper middle class. This can seem surprising, given that objectively it just isn't true and is getting less and less true every year. This, sli uh, this slide shows the proportion of U.S. adults in the lower and upper classes increasing at the expense of the middle class between 71 and 2015. One explanation for this disconnect is the belief among Americans that the U.S. is a middle class nation in which everyone has more or less the same opportunities to succeed as long as he or she is willing to work hard, persevere, and play by the rules. Another commonly held belief is that the U.S. is a land of opportunity in which upward mobility is easy and common. This set of beliefs goes by the name of the American Dream, which sees American society as a meritocracy based on, edu on educational and career achievement. One consequence of this, these beliefs, of course, is that the poor are by and large invisible in our culture, and when they are represented, they are portrayed as down on their luck, or worse, undeserving. After all, if the American Dream is readily attainable and based so solely on a willingness to work hard, then those who do not achieve it must be to blame. The numbers, however, belie these commonly held belief. When I say that the U.S. is a highly stratified uh, country, this is what it means from the perspective of an economist. If we look at the average household income from 67 to 2013, for example, we see a widespread between the top 20%, the middle 40%, and the bottom 40%. Here is the same data from 79 to 2013 that includes incomes up to the 99th percentile. Since 79, incomes of the bottom 40% have remained essentially flat, while incomes of the top 19% have almost doubled. Here is how the same data with the top 1% included. Now, let's look at how race affects these numbers. The racial gap in household income between blacks and whites persists. In 2014, the median, inco the median income of white households was 1.6 times greater than that of black households. But now, if we look at that median household wealth, which includes not only income, but value of your home, savings, stocks, retirement accounts, etc., we see a dramatic difference between black and white families and family wealth, with white households possessing almost 13 times more wealth than black households in 2013. And yet, despite these stark realities, we still want to click, uh, to click, to claim, <laughs> and I want to click, um, <laughs> to our middle class identity, even when we objectively can't. Having, car, uh, uh, having a house, maybe taking some vacations and education for the children. Um, and then he asked comments from the audience, and a young black man raises his hand and says, well, I have something to say about this. And he says, well, you know, middle class is relative. And he says, well, you see, uh, where I come from in, 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 in Flint, Michigan, uh, you know, forget about vacation and forget about two cars, maybe one car. Maybe we want to rent a good apartment, let alone um, own a, a, a house. And maybe we'll have some... Um, uh, Maybe we'll have a, some, you know, a good job, self safety, a security, education for the children, maybe, uh, but vacations we get. And so, I'll continue. <laughs> so, how do we explain this disconnect? Oh no, I'm sorry, punchline. Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> Punchline is, uh, the gentleman says, well, but you don't have any of these uh, things and you still uh, identify a middle class. And the guy says, yeah, it's relative. <laughs> so, how do we, ex how do we uh, explain this disconnect? Why is it so important for people to identify as middle class? Now, the answer is probably simple. The term middle class functions today as a social norm. It functions the way whiteness or heterosexuality does. It is both a default social identity and a transparent one uh, for those who identify with it. Uh, as everyone writes, what strikes me as particularly undeniable is that the absence of feeling of belonging uh, to a class is characteristic of the children of the bourgeoisie. People in a dominant position do not notice that they are positioned situated within a specific world, just as someone who is white or heterosexual <coughs> isn't necessarily aware of being so. So, it is therefore not that most people are middle class in the US, but that they feel they should be, or at least they should aspire to be. Middle class has become an aspirational norm of socioeconomic achievement. Reaching it or exceeding it is praiseworthy, Falling short is blameworthy. Middle class is then both a legitimizing category, belong to it, or a delegitimizing category, if you don't. Hence, the reluctance on the part of the young man in the video, which I reenacted, uh, to call himself uh, something else than middle class. But, by saying that middle class is relative, he might also have been pointing to the start of income and wealth disparity between black and white people in this country. So, what about social mobility? So that was that, that, was that. Um, Social mobility, here it is. Here's a table that illustrates the state of social mobility in the US in 2012. As you can see here, uh, there is what sociologists call stickiness at the bottom. Um, of the income ladder. Here we see that 70% of people raised in the bottom income quintile will stay below the middle quintile. Social mobility in of the United States in comparison with other countries. Uh, and we see that countries like Denmark, Norway, Finland, and this is reverse proportional, that is to say the more social mobility, the lower the number. Um, countries like Denmark, Norway, Finland, and Canada uh, have a social mobility rate that is much higher than the US, uh, which is right here. So, so far we've looked at quantitative analysis that measure income, wealth, and social mobility, but so far, we, all we have is a macro a description of how America society is stratified. Missing is an explanation of how class actually works at the level of individuals. We need to go beyond the statistics to understand how class is actually lived and experienced. How people understand their class position and how they come to identify or disidentify with the social class in which they were born. These figures also do not tell us why people, by and large, accept their class positions in an unequal society and why, as Pierre Bourdieu once asked, they do not revolt more often. So to answer these questions, we need a sociological approach, and so we now turn to Didier Perrimont's book. When Didier Ribon published Returning to France in 2009, he was best known in France as the author of the definite, uh, definitive biography of Michel Foucault and of a groundbreaking study of the formation of gay male identity. As an academic, he had introduced LGBT, LGBTQ studies in France, and as a public intellectual, he had advocated for same-sex marriage, which became legal in France in 2013. Here are some of his works. Returning to Hans then constituted a departure for Eribon, both stylistically and thematically. This was not a treatise, but a memoir. And this time, as George Chauncey writes in the introduction of the English translation, Didier Eribon came out again, not as gay, but as a son of the working class. But Eribon's book is 
not simply the story of the author's class alienation. Rather, returning to Hans is an analysis of the inner workings of the social world centered around his personal experience of, working, uh, of growing up the working class. Amy Bond's project differs from a, a traditional autobiographical account in that his aim is theoretical. In this book, he describes the lives of his grandparents, his parents, and his brothers in order to uncover the collective determinisms that shape their life chances. Behind the particulars of their individual fates, he wants to bring to light what he calls the implacable logic that governs the social world. This logic is articulated in returning to hands around four key concepts. The first is the notion that class is a social verdict. The second is the idea that class operates on us at the unconscious level. The third is the concept of class habitus, which makes <laughs> social inequalities acceptable. And the fourth, social shame, is conceived as an instrument of social control. So now, let us briefly examine each of these concepts and then to conclude uh, and to prepare you for your discussion uh, section, uh, we will watch an interview excerpted from a PBS program called People Like Us. And then I will ask you to test uh, the validity of these concepts as you watch Tammy, the person interviewed in the video, talk about her life. So there's a little exercise involved in this. Um, class as a social verdict. As we saw earlier in this lecture, statistically the social class in which you are born determines how, mu how uh, much determines much about your life chances. Class for everyone is a verdict, that is a sentence, a judgment, passed on you at birth. In fact, this verdict precedes your birth since the social class of your parents and even that of your grandparents will determine the sort of capital that you will inherit, whether this capital is wealth, education, or social relations. The class, then, is what opens or closes, or closes horizons of possibilities for one's life. Here is Eribon speaking of his father. He was chasing the only horizon open to him, the factory. It was waiting for him. He was waiting for it. He, it was also waiting for his brothers and sister, sisters who would follow in his footsteps. And it waited, and it still waits, for those who were born into families with the same social identity as his. Social determinism had a grip on him from the day that he was born. Now, of course, one could object that if social determinism is the key to the reproduction of the social order from generation to generation, how come Eribon managed to escape society's verdict to become a famous intellectual uh, in Paris, no less? Um, Eribon's answer uh, is simple. He got lucky. He was gay. His desire to live his homosexuality freely and his educational successes allowed him to deviate from the course his brother's lives took. But his escape was not achieved without tremendous guilt or alienation, nor was it without violence made to himself. He would remain estranged from his family for many years, dreading all the while that his working class origins, quote, I quote, like an accusation directed at me, would stick to my skin. To escape then, he had to transform himself. Basically, he writes, I was convicted twice, socially speaking. One conviction was based on class, and the other conviction on sexuality. There is no escaping from sentences such as these. I bear the mark of both of them. Yet, because they came into conflict with each other at a certain moment in my life, I was obliged to, sh um, I was obliged to shape myself by playing one off against the other. Class, social, and conscious. In an interview, Erimo explained that Returning to Hans is a book about the cruelty of the social world and about its violence. But he adds, it is also about the fact that this cruelty and this violence are so much a part of the fabric of our daily lives that we no longer even notice them. The social determinism Everyone covers 
are all the more powerful as they are invisible to those who are subjected to them. Class for Henri Bon, who follows Bourdieu here, is a social unconscious. Early socialization experiences in, one, in one's family or neighborhood work to make us aware of what we can or cannot aspire to be or to achieve. People like us, we say, do this or don't do this. We internalize at an early age our chances of success and failures. People like us don't go to college. And then we transform these evaluations of chances and failures into aspirations and expectations. For example, everyone's brothers dropped out of high school early. They didn't think school was for them. So they chose to leave school without obtaining their diploma. So everyone, this is an example of the way dominated people ratify their domination through the choices they make. It is also the way class structures are internalized and social positions accepted both by the dominated and the dominant. Anyone's brother felt they were exercising their freedom of choice when they dropped out. Whereas in reality, at Code Everyone, they were making unconsciously the choice they were intended to make. Of course, it is not as if his brothers did not know that other students stayed in school. Anyone writes, People know that things are different elsewhere, but that elsewhere seems part of a far off and inaccessible universe. So much so that people feel neither excluded from nor deprived of all sorts of things because they have no access to what in those far off social realms constitute a self-evident norm. It is in the order of things and there is nothing more to say about it. No one thinks about how the order of things actually works, because to do so would require being able to see oneself from a different point of view. It would require you to have a bird's eye view on your own life. Because they are seen as in the order of things, the mechanism of class positioning are not visible, but are experienced instead as personal choices. Class habitus. What people judge reasonable or unreasonable to do or to be in that position in the social world, what they judge likely or unlikely to happen to them, or what they see as natural or unthinkable to do or to say, stems from what uh, Baudieu and Erimon calls habitus. The term was coined by Pierre Baudieu to describe the way structural class disadvantages or advantages are internalized and transmitted intergenerationally through socialization, often producing the kind of, of, um, of self-defeating behavior we've seen, like dropping out of high school if you are in the lower class. Habitus contains the word habit, a behavior or an action that is repeated without having to consciously think about it. By analogy, the habitus of a certain class is composed of the habitual life choices, the cultural practice, the lifestyles, or even a set of tastes, preferences, or aversions shared by people who are in similar class or have similar life chances. Habitus, then, is what adjusts people's expectations and aspirations to the objective probabilities of their success. In this way, Erivan's brother's class habitus made them feel it made perfect sense for them to leave school and go to work while the middle class kids continued on. Habitus then explains why, explains why inegalitarian social arrangements make sense to both the dominated and the dominant classes and why people by and large accept their class positions in an unequal society. Class and shame. But in case the internalization of class structure is not enough to ensure the stability and the, and the reduction of social order, another instrument is deployed in the process of socialization, and that instrument is social shame. Striving to understand why it took him so long to talk about his working class background, anyone quickly identifies shame as the emotion or effect that made him remain for so long in what he calls the class closet. Social shame was not only as powerful as the sexual shame he had experienced as a young man, it was just as deeply constitutive of his identity and personality. 
I am the son of shame, he writes. It is then paradoxical that Evibon, who had made shame and stigma the core of his analysis of gay and male identity formation, had repressed the intense feeling of shame he had felt about his class origins after he left uh, Reims for Paris. For 35 years, while he was building a career as a Parisian intellectual, he emphasized his gay identity and totally repressed his class origins. It is only after the death of his father, a working class man whom he despised for his homophobia, that he started to consider what had led him not only to abandon his family, but to be ashamed of them and of himself. Shame, in this case, functions as both a product of internalized social hierarchies and their, and their and sorry, both as the product of internalized social uh, hierarchies and their legitimizing instrument. Feeling shame implies that one recognizes the legitimacy of the judgment placed upon oneself. Social shame in the context of Henri Bon's memoir is then the manifestation of his acceptance of the legitimacy of the social verdict that condemns who he is. As an effect, social shame legitimizes the social order and its inequalities and perpetuates it. Directed mm -hmm. inwardly, shame leaves no room for outrage or revolt in the face of social injustice. So, to conclude and recapitulate, we now have, I think, uh, perhaps uh, an answer to our initial question. The class closet, how do, we get, how do we get in and why don't we come out? The answer is threefold. One, the social determinisms that shape people's lives remain by and large invisible or unconscious to those who are subjected to them. Having internalized the social order and its hierarchies, people adjust their expectations and aspirations to what is reasonable to do in their positions. And finally, social shame serves to legitimize and perpetuate the social order and to forestall result, the revolt. So now it's your turn. And as you watch this video, think about how the way that the social world has shaped Tammy's life and that of her sons. <laughs>